In this series, we're learning who the devil is, how he operates, and what his tactics and goals are so that we can be prepared for his attacks on us. And we will be prepared when we put on the full armor of God so that we can take our stand against the devil's schemes. But before we get started, I just want to say thank you for listening to Bible Threads. It's truly a joy to prepare Bible Threads for you. I learn so much with each episode, and I hope you do too. My prayer is that you will grow in your knowledge of God's truth and experience His amazing love each and every day. Again, thanks for listening. The Bible is incredibly interconnected with threads that run through it from beginning to end. In this podcast, I will uncover these threads, help you dig deeper into God's truth, and inspire you to live your life with greater confidence and joy. Welcome to Bible Threads with me, Dr. Bruce Becker. Today's war zone is a well-known one in the New Testament. It involves the devil and Judas Iscariot, one of Jesus' twelve disciples. Now, you may recall that in a recent podcast series called True Crimes, we had an episode on Judas's betrayal of Jesus, making him an accessory to the crime of murder. Although we'll cover some of the same details about Judas in our episode today, this episode focuses much more on the devil, on Satan, and his tactics for destroying people. We need to be aware of his tactics because he still uses them. There's a descriptive phrase about Satan and Judas that we want to begin with today. It's used twice in the Gospel accounts, once in Luke's Gospel and once in John's Gospel. The phrase is, Satan entered Judas. In Luke's Gospel, chapter 22, we learn that Satan entered Judas sometime between Palm Sunday and Holy Thursday, likely on Tuesday or Wednesday of Holy Week. This is what Luke tells us. Now the festival of unleavened bread, called the Passover, was approaching, and the chief priests and teachers of the law were looking for some way to get rid of Jesus, for they were afraid of the people. Then Satan entered Judas, called Iscariot, one of the twelve. And Judas went to the chief priests and the officers of the temple guard and discussed with them how he might betray Jesus. They were delighted and agreed to give him money. He consented and watched for an opportunity to hand Jesus over to them when no crowd was present. The second time the phrase is used, with slightly different wording, is in John chapter 13. It occurred in the upper room where Jesus celebrated the Passover with his disciples during Holy Week. Jesus answered, It is the one to whom I will give this piece of bread when I have dipped it in the dish. Then dipping the piece of bread, he gave it to Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot. As soon as Judas took the bread, Satan entered into him. It's clear from the pages of the Bible that the devil can enter into people or even fully occupy the hearts and lives of people. So, this seems like a good place to take a little detour and talk about the different ways the devil does this. One way, and the most common way, is what the Bible refers to as demon possession or having an evil spirit. The Bible, especially the Gospels and the book of Acts, gives numerous examples of people possessed by demons or suffering from evil spirits. During Jesus' ministry, he healed numerous individuals of demon possession. Now, when it comes to demon possession, the devil is no respecter of persons. It didn't matter if you were a man or a woman or even a child. There are examples of each in the Bible. 
It also didn't matter if you were from Judea or Galilee or the city of Tyre or Ephesus. Jew and Gentile alike were targets of demon possession and evil spirits. What's quite interesting is that demon possession resulted in a wide variety of other symptoms. In Matthew chapter 9, we hear that a man who was demon-possessed and could not talk was brought to Jesus. On another occasion, some followers of Jesus brought him a demon-possessed man who was blind and mute, and Jesus healed him so that he could both talk and see. One day, as Jesus was approaching a crowd of people, a man came out of the crowd and knelt before Jesus. He asked that the Lord would have mercy on his epileptic son, who was demon-possessed. Some of Jesus' disciples had tried to heal the boy, but they weren't able to do it. Jesus chalked it up to a lack of faith on their part. So the boy was brought to Jesus, and Jesus rebuked the demon, and it came out of the boy, and he was healed at that moment. Early in his ministry, Jesus went to the synagogue in Capernaum, a northwest coastal town on the Sea of Galilee. In the synagogue, there was a man possessed by a demon, an impure spirit. He cried out at the top of his voice, Go away! What do you want with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. Be quiet! Jesus said sternly, Come out of him. Then the demon threw the man down before them all and came out without injuring him. On another occasion, Jesus and his disciples traveled to Tyre, a coastal city in Syria. There Jesus met a woman. The woman was a Greek born in Syrian Phoenicia. She begged Jesus to drive the demon out of her daughter. And Jesus did. During his ministry, Jesus traveled about from town and village to another, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom of God. The twelve were with him and also some women who had been cured of evil spirits and diseases. Mary called Magdalene, from whom seven demons had come out. In addition to Mary Magdalene, we learn about Joanna and Susanna. These women became followers of Jesus, and they personally supported his ministry. One of the more bizarre examples of demon possession in the Gospels occurred after Jesus had crossed the Sea of Galilee and came ashore on its eastern banks in the region of the Gadarenes. This account is recorded in both Matthew's Gospel and Luke's Gospel. From Matthew's Gospel, we learn that in that region, Two demon-possessed men, coming from the tombs, met him. They were so violent, and no one could pass that way. "'What do you want with us, Son of God?' they shouted. "'Have you come here to torture us before the appointed time?' Some distance from them was a large herd of pigs was feeding. The demons begged Jesus, "'If you drive us out, send us into the herd of pigs.' He said to them, Go. So they came out and went into the pigs, and the whole herd rushed down the steep bank into the lake and died in the water. Those tending the pigs ran off, went to the town, and reported all of this, including what had happened to the demon-possessed men. We learn from Luke's account that these demons were called legion because they were many. These two demon-possessed men had superhuman strength and were violent toward anyone who traveled near their cemetery home. But on this occasion, they too were healed by Jesus of their demon possession. In the book of Acts, there are two encounters of demon possession that we want to mention. One was in the city of Philippi in Macedonia. Luke, the author of Acts, recounted the event. Once, when we were going to the place of prayer, we were met by a female slave who had a spirit by which she predicted the future. She earned a great deal of money for her owners by fortune-telling. 
She followed Paul and the rest of us, shouting, These men are servants of the Most High, who are telling you the way to be saved. She kept this up for many days. Finally, Paul became so annoyed that he turned around and said to the Spirit, In the name of Jesus Christ, I command you to come out of her. At that moment, the Spirit left her. When the slave girl's owners realized that their source of income had evaporated, they had Paul and his colleagues Silas and Luke thrown into prison. But this actually turned out well. Because Paul and Silas were in jail, and the Lord God performed a miracle that rocked the place, the jailer of the prison in Philippi and his family came to know and believe in Jesus. One more example from the Apostle Paul's journeys. This one occurred in the city of Ephesus. Luke wrote about this event too. God did extraordinary miracles through Paul so that even handkerchiefs and aprons that had touched him were taken to the sick and illnesses were cured and the evil spirits left them. Some Jews who went around driving out evil spirits tried to invoke the name of the Lord Jesus over those who were demon-possessed. They would say, In the name of Jesus whom Paul preaches, I command you to come out. Seven sons of Sceva, a Jewish chief priest, were doing this. One day the evil spirit answered them, Jesus I know, and Paul I know about, but who are you? Then the man who had the evil spirit jumped on them and overpowered them all. He gave them such a beating that they ran out of the house naked and bleeding. Again, superhuman strength and violence was on display in this demon-possessed man who beat up the seven sons of Sceva, leaving them bloodied and missing some articles of clothing. So, you may be wondering why we've looked at these examples of demon possession during the ministries of Jesus and Paul, when in fact our war zone for today involves Satan and Judas Iscariot. Well, with these examples, we see a contrast between demon possession and what the Bible describes as Satan entering Judas. They seem to be quite different. For example, with demon possession, the person possessed was an unwilling participant. Judas, on the other hand, appears to have been willingly influenced by Satan. With demon possession, the person possessed had an unwanted physical, emotional, or medical condition, or possessed superhuman strength. Not the case with Judas Iscariot. He doesn't have any such condition and doesn't act like someone who is demon-possessed. So if Judas Iscariot wasn't demon-possessed, what is meant by Satan entering Judas? Well, do you remember King David's war zone? We considered it in the fifth episode of this series. The episode was entitled David's Downfall. Judas Iscariot's war with Satan was similar to King David's. If you recall, Satan incited, or maybe better said, seduced David into counting his fighting men. In that episode, I suggested that we think of Satan's role as a seed sower. He sows seeds of doubt, of desire, of pride, of jealousy, of lust, of greed, of a quest for power, and many more. In the case of David, Satan used David's pride to blind him from what others could see was a terrible, ungodly decision on his part. In the case of Judas Iscariot, Satan sowed seeds of greed because he knew that greed was a big weakness of Judas. He loved money. He was also in charge of Jesus and the disciples' finances. Now, there's nothing wrong with being a chief financial officer, but Judas was also a thief. He embezzled money from the ministry of Jesus. You know, there's an important lesson to be learned from both David and Judas. Satan goes after a person's weaknesses. 
That's why it's important for each of us to look into the mirror and ask, well, what are my weaknesses? You can be sure that the devil and his minions know what they are. The devil and his demons use our weaknesses to get a foot in the door of our heart. So again, Sometime between Palm Sunday and Holy Thursday, Satan entered Judas, the first of the two times mentioned in the Gospels. Judas then went to the chief priests and the officers of the temple guard and discussed with them how he might betray Jesus. And again, they were delighted and agreed to give him money. He consented and watched for an opportunity to hand Jesus over to them when no crowd was present. Satan entered Judas. Judas initiated a meeting with the chief priests, the Jewish authorities, and the officers of the temple guard, those responsible for guarding the temple, its treasury, and all of its furnishings. They were Jewish law enforcement. The meeting was a planning meeting for how to hand Jesus over to the Jewish authorities. An important component of the plan was to hand over Jesus when there wasn't a crowd of people around Jesus. The second time Satan entered Judas was in the upper room where Jesus and his disciples celebrated the Passover. At the table, Jesus told his disciples that one of them would betray him. In response to that question posed by the Apostle John, who is it? Jesus answered, it is the one to whom I will give this piece of bread when I have dipped it in the dish. Again, then dipping the piece of bread, he gave it to Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot. As soon as Judas took the bread, Satan entered into him. The plan that Judas had hatched with the chief priests and temple guards officials was soon to be put into action. So Jesus told Judas, what you are about to do, do quickly. But no one at the meal understood why Jesus said this to him. Since Judas had charge of the money, some thought Jesus was telling him to buy what was needed for the festival or to give something to the poor. As soon as Judas had taken the bread, he went out, and it was night. It should not be lost on us that Satan showed up in Judas's life to influence him. And there is a lesson for us here, too. Satan would love to show up in our lives to lead us to walk away from our relationship with Jesus. Staying connected to Jesus is what prevents Satan from entering our hearts. After Judas left, Jesus and the other disciples remained in the upper room for several hours. Jesus gave his disciples a new command, to love one another. He also predicted that Peter would deny him three times before the sun would come up the next day. Jesus then did some teaching, promising to send them the Holy Spirit. And he also spent time in prayer. He prayed for himself, he prayed for his disciples, and he prayed for all of those who would believe in him, you and me included. After he had finished praying, Jesus and his disciples left the upper room and headed to the Mount of Olives, on which was the Garden of Gethsemane, where Jesus again prayed. He asked his Father in heaven, if possible, to take away the cup of suffering that he was about to endure. Fortunately for us, the Father didn't take away that cup. That cup is why we have today the forgiveness of sins and a new life with God. It is in the olive grove that we meet Judas Iscariot once again. Judas knew the place because Jesus had often met there with his disciples. So Judas came to the garden, guiding a detachment of soldiers and some officials from the chief priests and the Pharisees. They were carrying torches, lanterns, and weapons. There, Judas betrayed Jesus with a kiss. Like a skilled boxer, Satan has a one-two punch. His first punch is to tempt us to disobey God. His second punch is then to accuse us of having disobeyed God. Ah, that seems like a cruel tactic, but that's the way Satan operates. 
And like a skilled boxer, he doesn't just throw his pair of punches occasionally. He does it continuously. And that's what he did to Judas. Satan threw the first punch earlier in the week. As we mentioned earlier, Satan entered Judas and tempted him to betray Jesus. Satan led Judas to meet with the chief priests and the leaders of the temple guard, the Jewish leaders. And they offered Judas 30 pieces of silver to hand Jesus over to them. Judas accepted the offer, and Satan landed his first punch. Satan's second punch was thrown on Friday morning of Holy Week just after Jesus was condemned by the Jewish religious leaders and led away to go on trial before Governor Pontius Pilate. When Judas, who had betrayed him, saw that Jesus was condemned, he was seized with remorse and returned the thirty pieces of silver to the chief priests and the elders. I have sinned, he said, for I have betrayed innocent blood. What is that to us? they replied. That's your responsibility. So Judas threw the money into the temple and left. Then he went away and hanged himself. Can't you just imagine Satan whispering in Judas's heart and mind, You betrayed Jesus, even though you know he's innocent. Why did you do something so despicable? For the last three years, you've been with him. You've seen his miracles and enjoyed his teaching. Why did you betray him? You know the 30 pieces of silver you have in your pocket are blood money, don't you? You're no friend of Jesus. What must he think about you? He must hate you. You're a traitor. You don't deserve to live another day. Satan's second punch landed a crushing blow. Judas saw no hope and no future and no reason to live. He returned to the temple, threw the money on the temple floor, and then went away and hanged himself. Satan's accusations led Judas to despair and then to his own self-destruction and judgment. Satan is not our friend. He is our sworn enemy. He wants to destroy us as he destroyed Judas Iscariot. So how do we defend ourselves? Well, the Apostle Paul, in his letter to the Christians living in Ephesus, gives us the answer. And these are powerful words. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Therefore, put on the full armor of God, so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground. And after you have done everything, to stand. To stand. stand firm, then, with the belt of truth buckled around your waist, with the breastplate of righteousness in place, and with your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. In addition to all this, take up the shield of faith, with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. War zone. Judas's Judgment. In our next episode, we'll visit a war zone where a husband wife couple succumb to the devil's favorite temptation lying. If you have any comments or questions regarding this episode, I'd love to hear from you. Just email me at bruce at timeofgrace.org. Thanks for listening, and God bless.